click on the Settings button near the bottom right hand corner of your screen. Then click on Subtitles, then English. Most devices translate directly to English, but you can have access to many other languages too. Pour le français, il faut appuyer à nouveau sur la touche Settings. Ensuite, cliquez sur Subtitle, Auto Translate, et choisissez la langue de votre choix. Si vous voulez le français, French. Voilà. Bon service tout le monde. Enjoy the service. Yes. 
sujet de ma joie. Alléluia. Je loue l'éternel de tout mon cœur. Je raconterai toutes tes merveilles, je chanterai ton nom. Je louerai l'éternel de tout mon cœur. Je ferai de toi le sujet de ma joie. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters, and welcome to our Eastern Canadian worship service this morning. My name is Fervin. And my name is Jasmine, and this is Leon. Say hi, buddy. <laughs> he says hi. Uh, it's so exciting, and, and what a privilege for us to just welcome you guys as we kick off our congregational service of 2021 with the next generation. And uh, we've got an exciting, exciting service planned for you. And I really love these times of worship, you know, from, from the East Coast, from, from Halifax to Quebec to, to churches across Ontario, as, you know, not only get, we get to worship God in, in English, but also in French as well. You know, hearing the songs and, and scriptures in French is such an awesome reminder of how big the kingdom really mm. is. Um, for today's service, uh, we have a, a new sister who was recently baptized last month from Ottawa. Her name's Khadija. And uh, she's going to be sharing her journey with God with us this morning. Uh, very, very inspiring. We'll also be hearing from Brother Josh Udall from Halifax, uh, who will be sharing a bit about his story as well with us this morning. And uh, the title of the lesson today is God is Not an Algorithm. Mm. Uh, we're going to be hearing from an awesome brother and sisters who we love, who, uh, you know, who, who lead the campus ministry uh, out of Montreal, Nathaniel and uh, Janae Zero. Uh, so excited to hear them and hear the word from them. Um, at this time, I'm going to pass on to my wife, Jasmine, who'll be reading a scripture for us to kind of just prepare our hearts this morning. Um, so it's Psalm 100, 3 to 5. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And I find just so much comfort in this scripture, um, knowing that God's faithfulness will continue um, through all generations, regardless of what's happening. And um, that he is still working, that he continues to love, that he will always remain faithful, all because we are his. And I'm just so grateful for the scripture that God loves us that much. Amen. That's awesome. I'm going to pass it on to Owen and Lauren, who's going to just continue to prepare our hearts for worship services. They pray. Thank you and enjoy for the rest of the service. All right, let's pray. Père Dieu éternel, je veux te remercier tellement pour ces journées, pour ce matin avec lequel tu nous as bénis. Um, C'est vraiment un privilège de pouvoir entrer dans ton présence uh, et d'avoir ce rapport avec toi. Uh, je veux te demander ce matin que tu nous donnes une portion doublée de ton esprit, que tu ouvres nos cœurs et nos âmes à ton uh, esprit uh, pour qu'il puisse nous donner de la sagesse uh, que nous av avons besoin. Um, uh, je te remercie tellement pour Jésus et pour le sacrifice qu'il a fait sur la croix pour nous, uh, avec lequel nous ne pouvons pas avoir uh, cette Uh, rapport uh, avec toi. Uh, nous ne pouvons pas uh, avoir cette relation et je suis, uh, je suis vraiment uh, heureux que je peux être un, un fils uh, de la Dieu éternel. Uh, merci beaucoup pour tout ce que tu fais pour nous et je prie uh, tout cela dans le nom de Jésus. Amen. Heavenly Father, we are so excited to be able to worship you this morning. We are grateful for your love and your unfailing kindness, for your overflowing mercy and grace that you have generously shown towards us. Father, we thank you that we are able to gather together this morning to worship you. And we pray so much that 
it will honor you, it will glorify you, that it will exalt you. Father, we thank you that we're able to gather together even though we're distances apart. We pray so much for the unity of Montreal, Halifax, Hamilton, Ottawa, and Newmarket, that you continue to strengthen that unity and help us to grow. Father, we want to pray also for the next generation. God, we pray so much that we will be able to preach to the hearts of the young women and young men in this world today. God, we pray that you will provide us with young leaders who are fired up about Jesus, God, and ready to go out into your mission field. Lord, we pray so much that you will put visions and dreams on the heart of the young in the churches, God. And Father, that you will bless and help those visions and dreams um, to be fruitful. Father, we want to pray for this service. Please be with Josh as he preaches the word this morning. We pray so much that as we listen to Josh, that our hearts will be open and receptive to the message that we hear. We pray also that God, we take what we hear and go out and share it with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors, whoever we can, we share the good message of Jesus. God, help us to be bold. Help us to be fearless about um, the message of Jesus. Lord, we are so grateful for your son and his sacrifice. And God, we uh, are so excited about Jesus coming back and that we have heaven to look forward to. Lord, we love you so much. And it's all in your son's name that we pray. Amen. What does it mean to have vision? Vision is the ability to see, to know that to get into a building, you have to find an opening. The ability to be instructed by the things in your path, not obstructed. Vision is a gift, a gift of choice, a choice to make the world into something, something better. We live in a world where everyone is blindfolded. We walk around bumping into things and trying to find direction. When I was blind, I relied on people's perceptions of me to determine my worth. When I was blind, I didn't know that God would still choose to love me even at my lowest point. Um, I thought that the real Christians were the extroverted, the bold, uh, sharing their faith all the time. When I was blind, I didn't realize how prideful I was. I thought I could not feel or look beautiful. Uh, for me, when I was aveugle, I didn't have conscience of my need of God. I was blind when I believed that in this life it has to be about performance and you know thinking that God wouldn't love you if you don't perform. When I was blind I thought I could make myself worthy of God's grace. I didn't know what it looked like to have a loving relationship with God. I felt alone. Many people have worn these blindfolds their whole life and haven't noticed that they can be taken off. Um, so I now know that just because someone has a different way of living uh, their faith, um, it is no less valuable and it won't be used by God any less. Now I know that beauty comes from within. And the more I love and accept myself, the more I can love others. I now know that uh, God had a plan for me that fits into his overall plan. My purpose is no longer to please people, but to please God. Now. I know that I am I'm loved. loved. And it's not because of what I do, but who I am. I now know that nothing can separate me from the love of God, and there's nothing I can do to make him love me more or less. We have the power to remove the blindfolds of the world so they can share in our vision. My vision for God's kingdom is for it to just grow each and every day, spreading love and righteousness across all the nations. In the future, I see myself and everyone around me valuing their relationship with God more than anything. I see myself in a community that not only embraces the good times with me, but also the challenging and difficult ones. I see a world where women and men know from a young age how beautiful and amazing they are and they don't need anything else to secure them but God. I see a world where poverty would no longer be an issue because people would care about others' needs above their own. 
I see a life where we can just show God's love to people on a constant basis and correct their understanding of Him. Et pour le futur, mais il y a plein de rêves, une vision veut aussi par la grâce de Dieu être pouvoir planter une église quelque part. And my vision of the future is that we can put the body of Christ passage into action, that we can see the value of every single part. But I see disciples of Jesus shining, not allowing their prejudices to get in the way. And we just display God's love to those who need it the most. What's your vision? question that I have, Kadisha, is tell us just a little bit about yourself. You know, your name, your family, how you grew up, um, what you're studying, uh, if you're in school, just things that, you know, so that people can get to know you a little bit. So my name is Kadisha Kamara. I'm 21 years old. I grew up in Montreal, Quebec. I'm studying currently in Bishop's University in Psychology. And I grew up with my father in a Muslim home. And now I'm currently living with my mom in Ottawa. Wow, that's amazing. Um, you know, especially the idea that you grew up in a Muslim home. So um, what prompted you to want to study the Bible? Um, I feel like for a long time in my life, I was always just feeling of big void inside of me and I was chasing after a lot of things trying to figure out a lot of things like school living on my own starting a business different things that I thought would give me the sense of completion and no matter what I did I felt like nothing would fill that up mm. and I would even talk to my mom about it and she'd be like well it's God God will fill you up <laughs> and I think like just after a while of trying things out on my own, I opened up and said, well, let me see if it's true. Let me find out for myself. And that's when I decided I'm ready to study the Bible. And I was pleasantly surprised. <laughs> yeah. You know, as we studied the Bible and you learn more about God and you um, grew to understand him more, what do you think that thing was that, you know, led you to decide, yes, I want to be baptized? Well, after reading the Gospels and seeing Jesus's story, I felt like that was really what convinced me that this is what is going to fill me up and give me clarity and purpose and uncondition unconditional love. So that's really what convicted me. I think the most challenging thing was in just surrendering to Christ. I think I have so many questions and I have this eagerness to know and understand everything to a point that it frustrates me. And <laughs> I remember asking you and Yvonne so many questions, so many things that I wanted to know and Yvonne hit me with uh, Isaiah 55, I think verse 8, mm. and that was uh, something that really like humbled me and made me understand that, you know, it's okay not to know all the answers, but it was tough for me to, to want to know when to want to have the answers right away and to want to understand everything to completion when that's not how it works. If there's anything that you would like to say to, to anyone who is seeking God or doesn't know about God or wants to know about God, um, maybe tentative and even wanting to jump in and study scripture, what, what would you say to them? I think really for me, the way I see it, it's really the best thing that you can do until you find God and you realize what you're put on this earth to do. You're really just swinging in the wind and this gives you roots, yes. That's awesome.
believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died, was buried, and rose in the, in the third day? Yes. What is your good confession? Jesus is Lord. Amen. 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 So because of your good confession, I can now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Troubles come my way. Troubles come my way. I gotta pray sometimes. I gotta pray sometimes. The troubles come my way. Troubles come my way. I gotta pray sometimes. I gotta pray sometimes. Well, don't you know that my Jesus, Jesus he will fix it. For my Lord Jesus, Jesus he will fix it. I said, my love, Jesus. Jesus, he will fix it. After a while. After a while. Troubles come my way. Troubles come my way. I gotta sing sometimes. I gotta sing sometimes. Troubles come my way. Troubles come my way. I gotta sing sometimes. I gotta sing sometimes. Don't you know that my Jesus. Jesus he Jesus, you will fix it. I said, my Lord Jesus. Jesus, you will fix it. After a while. After a while. Troubles come my way. Troubles come my way. I gotta walk sometimes. I gotta walk sometimes. Troubles come my way. Troubles come my way. I gotta walk sometimes. I gotta walk sometimes. Don't you know that? God is not an algorithm. That is the title of today's lesson, and we're very grateful that you have taken the time out to be able to join us this morning. Uh, grateful to be here, part one of two parts of today's lesson. Very grateful to be able to do this in conjunction with Nate and Jenea. I've uh, got to meet them earlier uh, this week, and they're a fantastic couple, and very much count myself lucky to be able to do a, a two-part with them. Unfortunately, Kelsey was uh, supposed to be able to be here with me, but you know she's in absolute hustle mode right now with school and just really couldn't pull the time out to really gather her thoughts and really be able to take time to be able to share in a uh, manner that she felt was necessary. So sadly, obviously, I aren't gonna be able to have her today, but uh, you know, I hope that we'll be able to do 
a good enough job for the both of us to share kind of what we've been going through and what we're learning and why did we go with the term God is not an algorithm or why did we go with the title God is not an algorithm? Well, a couple things with that and uh, A, you know, today as you've seen is the theme is next gen <laughs> uh, and so really the whole idea of it behind it is you know, when it comes to social media content and those who create content for these platforms, you know, the the the, the term that's thrown around quite frequently amongst these creators is the algorithm. You know, the algorithm's got me down. You know, they for whatever reason, the algorithm's not showing my content to people. I'm not getting as many views. I'm not getting as many likes. People aren't sharing it as often. Oh my gosh, it's the algorithm's fault. I was doing well until the algorithm updated again and now I'm all messed over. Uh, and so it becomes this whole inside joke and in some cases very serious situation where um, people are trying to figure out how the algorithm is working. You know, okay, if I post this type of content, I will get this type of reaction, this, that, the other. And the reason why I wanted to go with this title today is because it went with the theme of something I've been learning in my life as well as uh, Nate's going to share a little later. Um, about how we can tend to put God in a box and we try to crack God as if he is some type of algorithm. And the reality is he is so much bigger and vast than we can ever imagine. And even when we think we got him figured out, well, you know, you don't. <laughs> so that's kind of, these are the types of things that we've been learning, at least myself I've been learning. And I figured I'd take some time to share that today of what I've been going through, what me and Kelsey have been going through and uh, what we are really trying to grow in and what we found ourselves growing in and uh, and things of that nature. So I figured we'd take the time to really jump in uh, and share those things. So again, very grateful uh, to be able to have this uh, platform to share. It took a lot of thought with Danny Breezebois and, um, and also Greg Taylor here in Halifax to really discuss how I was going to go about doing this. Um, there's been a lot of kind of craziness going on uh, here in Halifax, obviously, and uh, in terms of COVID, and it's been a crazy year, but as well as with our uh, ministry couple and my parents stepping down, uh, it's just kind of like it's led to a lot of interesting thoughts and conversations and um, has allowed me to kind of really take some time to really think through what does my relationship with God look like through all of this? And, how do I want to adjust? And so be able to kind of set things up kind of where, how I got to where I am now. Figure we, we, we'd rewind all the way back to March 2020. Yeah, who wants to do that? But here we go. So, um, you know, March 2020 hit all as we, as we know and big things happened, at least here in Halifax. That's, you know, uh, I remember it as the day the NBA shut down. And I was like, oh man, things have gotten very real. And when my sports started getting affected by this whole virus stuff, I was like, oh man, this thing's actually uh, real. <laughs> so uh, things are getting kind of crazy. And, uh, and so that's when we as a church really had to kind of figure out, all right, what are we going to be doing? How are we going to adjust this? How are we going to you know, meet the needs of our members and meet the needs of the disciples here? And you know, we've also quickly shifted to digital and quickly shifted to what we were going to do for sermons and how we were going to get... Um, try to encourage the, the disciples here and try to figure it all out. And I was a big part of that in a lot of ways in terms of I wasn't in front of any camera like we are right now. Um, quite frankly, I think it's my first lesson I've done in front of a camera through COVID. Um, but I did a lot of the behind the scenes, always making sure that you know, we're getting files together, um, trying to pl help plan the services out, um, trying to make sure... Um, at least uh, my dad at the time knew what he was doing and how to be able to allow him to deliver his sermons. Um, getting Megan uh, to help out with songs, which she was a great help in that. Very grateful for her doing that and sacrificing the time, the time she did. And it was just really trying to like, I kind of, kind of almost became project manager overnight and really trying. The reality at the end of the day, which was this kind of more interesting part is uh, yes, my father was doing the lessons, but um, he had to relinquish a lot of control because this this tech stuff was not in his wheelhouse, um, and it really kind of relied on me. And it kind of felt like, in a lot of ways, I had now become in the behind the scenes leader of the church in terms, of at least how Sunday sermons were going to be going. Um, you know, like uh, I appreciated the humility of the older leadership couples here in the church of just being like, "Hey, Josh, we don't really know what we're doing." 
it's up to you. <laughs> Can you help us out? And I did my best to direct and kind of help uh, to really make that a seamless transition. Um, but over time, I really felt like over the course of COVID, um, trying to figure out different ways to encourage disciples, trying to figure out different ways to encourage people, uh, I realized I had, um, I started to get pretty burnt out. Uh, I mean, I Sundays, obviously my whole, you know, I'd spend about three or four hours on a Sunday to prep and obviously produce the service, but as well leading up throughout the week, uh, make sure midweeks were, were up for people, um, making sure that people were getting, or disciples were getting nourishment throughout the week, figure out different ways to do that, and um, and so on and so forth, right? And uh, it, it started getting tiring because I essentially was putting in a quite amount of hours every week to make sure everything was prepped and, and, and uh, taken care of. Uh, and it started becoming less of something that was fun and started becoming more of a chore. Um, and then as time went wore on, I knew it wasn't a personal issue, but you know, I did my best to try and fight through the feelings. But you know, started hearing uh, people complaining that you know digital wasn't doing it for them, and they just couldn't wait to get together. And you know, wasn't like that's that's the reality. We're all feeling it right now. Like quite frankly, I'm sure there is a significant drop off in terms of our viewership uh, today than it was even at the beginning of the pandemic. If I'm being honest, like that's just the reality of things. But when you're putting in all those hours and people are kind of like, yeah, I'm kind of done and, and they stop tuning in and they stop watching and you're just kind of like, why am I doing this? Like, forget it. You know, I, I, I'm not gonna lie, like my heart got pretty hard um, and frustrated. Um, and I really started slowly doing the bare minimum to get by, um, which wasn't fair to anybody, uh, but I was really struggling uh, through that. And and throughout, throughout the co end of COVID, or through the end of 2020, um, you know, things started kind of um, rolling out in terms of different situations that have happened and um, in terms of, you know, the change of leadership in our church here in Halifax and what things are going to look like in this period of not having any leadership uh, or paid leadership. Uh, what's it all look like? And, uh, and I kind of got to the point where I was like, I just I had to really take a time to acknowledge my burnout, uh, acknowledge what I've been going through. Me and Kelsey really had to sit down and really think through, all right, what does this mean for us? What do we want to do? You know, we've gone so long just going to the next meeting of the body, the next thing that has to be done for the church. I got to the point in my personal walk where I just, I was so tired and burnt out that I just had no time. I was even taking a dive in my own, like, paid work that I was, you know, with my, for my employer, I was really not, it was really tough for me. And, um, which I'm sure a lot of us were feeling the same way, I'm sure. Uh, but that's kind of what I was going through and I saw a dip in energy, uh, absolutely. And the only time I really had outside, like the only, I only made time for like one or two discipling relationships with people that could really help me, yeah, but I was, I was useless um, from an energy perspective. But that's kind of what I was, I was going through and running with and really struggling to, to really kind of figure out what's going on. So me and Kelsey, as you know, news broke out and people were trying to figure out what, what, uh, how it, what the news meant for them, uh, me and Kelsey really decided to take up time. We've taken a step back um, and really taking time for ourselves as a married couple, taking our time for ourselves as disciples of Jesus, what does our relationship with God look like moving forward? How do we want to um, adjust and A, stay faithful, uh, B, make it to heaven, <laughs> and, and C, uh, what do we need um, moving forward from a church family and those who are around us? Um, and we ha I'm happy to say, at least for myself, I've seen a lot of growth and things I've realized for me. And uh, the big thing I've learned at this point is um, I, I, I definitely have struggled a lot in my past. And it will always be a struggle, I'm sure. But just this idea that just the performance mentality, like there's always got to be something that needs to be done. Um, and that's how I burn myself out a lot, whether it be in the church or in, in work, you know, like it's happened already where I've, I've run myself ragged and my clients are, have been calling me out in my character, um, that I haven't been vulnerable with them, I'm not real with them, I keep trying to plow through and they can tell when my energy levels have dipped and they're not getting my best work. That's been convicting um, and seeing kind of the parallels between 
you know, church Josh and, and work Josh. And I'm like, wow, um, there's, some, there's some significant character deficiencies that I need to grow in there. And, um, and, uh, and so just being real myself, like, all right, what, what, I had to ask myself the question, like, all right, what do I, what fills my soul? What fills my spirit? You know, and filling my spirit is just going for walks and praying, uh, singing songs, uh, just reading the scriptures and listening to podcasts and like really trying to dig deep into what is God's word and what does it mean for me? What I've learned lately is God just wants you to wake up, spend time with him, pour your heart out to him, and he will literally do the rest. All he does is want you to prepare and show up. Um, what does that look like? Well, I'll tell you this. Right now, I'm loving my life as a Christian right now. Um, you know, the amount, I got had to take a step back, and with the amount of double dates Kelsey and I have been on with people at this point, or just our non-Christian friends, we're just, we're just going out and having fun with them, and they've been seeing a difference, and they've been vocalizing these things. And I'm like, I'm not trying to do anything. I'm just trying to have fun and, uh, and just show up. And what I mean by that, by just showing up, is being available. Uh, that's the one piece of advice I received years ago is it just be available. I'm like, what does that even mean, man? I'm like, be available. I mean, just keep being like Jesus. Be compassionate, empathetic, loving. Uh, be full of conviction uh, and excitement. Um, and, and just keep being available because the time will come when someone will be going through something hard. And they're, you're the only one they're going to reach out to. They're the only bit of Jesus they have in their life that they can reach out to and get fulfillment from and encouragement from and hope from in some cases. And I can say that's, that's happened to me. Um, I've actually already had a friend of mine uh, call me out of nowhere and going through some significant issues. And we've never really had a... Actually, we just didn't really have a great friendship at all, a great relationship. It was actually kind of toxic in a lot of ways. Um, but I was the one they called when they're going through a really tough time with their family. And all they said was, I, mean, I know we've had a rocky relationship, but I know you and Kelsey are faith, faith people. And uh, I just wonder if you could pray for us. And uh, I just need to know that there's something looking out for me at this time. And I was like, this is what God means by just, just showing up. Um, you know, just being available, keep having quiet times, keep spending time with God, and people will reach out to you because we live in an age of information. People are sick and tired of being told how they're wrong or what's wrong with them. They just need love. They need a friend. They need someone who can be shade for them in the desert. Um, and that is something I've significantly grown in and just, I'm just living my life right now. Life is good. Life is very good for us. And uh, we're very grateful for God's got us at this current time. Um, and we've just had people reaching out to us left, right, and center, just want to spend time. And, uh, and I'm, just, I'm just here to be the fun guy, um, the guy who's got Jesus convictions, but it isn't in your face. And uh, we're very, very grateful um, that God can just use us. That's, I'm just grateful to be used by God. Um, there is no crazy scripture to share right now. Again, this has just been more of a sharing. Um, you know, the one thing I have learned is the deserts that the Israelites have gone through at different points in the scriptures. Um, and i just hearing, they're just seeing you know, how times they just desperately just want water or just some type of relief. That's the kind of relief God wants us to have for people uh, going through this world. It's just people are parched. Sometimes they realize it, sometimes they don't. But they, they, they sense a difference and they know a difference in you. And they will come to you to, for, them, for you to be their shade. And God will guide the conversation. If you keep showing up, you keep reading your Bible, keep spending time with him and being in his word, and being, uh, going to him in prayer, it will not, when the day of unknown comes, it will not be a coincidence how you react. So... Keep praying for me and Kelsey. Uh, we are continuing to grow on this on this journey of what God wants for us and what we need moving forward. And um, and uh, I, that's all I know is I'm just going to keep showing up. And speaking of showing up, I figured it might be a great way to end today's, at least my portion of the sermon, with coming to the place that uh, 
I definitely get a lot of encouragement from him. I love coming to my prey walks and just being one with God. It's just in the middle of the woods. And uh, that's where I can really think, wow, God really speak. Uh, hear the birds chirp, hear all the wilderness. I see a lot of deer up in here, all kinds of it. It's amazing. And uh, I figured this might be a great way to, to kind of end things off. I would love to share with you a scripture that I always go back to in times of doubt, times of uncertainty, to help me renew my fire for God. In Joshua 24, verse 14 through 15, it says, Now therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your father served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your father served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now dwell in. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. It's all on you, Nate and Janelle. Let's do this. Thank you so much, Josh, for sharing with us uh, with such vulnerability and authenticity. My name is Nate, and it's my wife, Janelle. And it's such an honor to share with, with you guys this morning um, and uh, building on the theme of God is not an algorithm. I'm actually going to be sharing in French. Uh, so from now on, I will speak in French. Donc, Dieu n'est pas un algorithme. Et le terme algorithme au fait fait référence, comme utilisé un peu présentement dans la culture, à quelque chose qu'on peut contrôler, manipuler, truquer en fin de compte afin de pouvoir réaliser nos propres objectifs. Je m'explique. Donc il y a beaucoup de gens, euh, surtout dans le contexte des médias sociaux, qui euh, pensent être des experts de, admettons Instagram ou euh, Facebook, qui ont compris la façon dont ce logiciel-là fonctionne, donc la façon dont l'algorithme fonctionne, et puis ont les meilleures idées, les meilleures pratiques euh, sur comment faire pour mieux exploiter cet algorithme-là. Euh, et, et je pense qu'il y a un parallèle aussi à faire en question de comment on vit notre vie. Il y a un engouement en ce moment euh, par rapport à, 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 à la distribution, si on veut, massive d'idées. Il y a beaucoup de personnes qui prônent avoir compris l'algorithme de la vie, donc c'est-à-dire comment notre vie doit être vécue, et ils veulent nous dire qu'est-ce qu'on doit croire, pourquoi on doit le croire, et, euh, et avec qui on doit s'associer, avec qui on ne doit pas s'associer. Euh, et j'ai un peu peur aussi, lorsque je regarde même l'Église, qu'il y a un peu cette tendance-là aussi dans l'Église, où, euh, surtout dans le contexte où on est en ce moment, parce qu'on ne sait pas trop quoi faire, ni comment l'Église doit fonctionner, euh, donc, il y a, y a des gens qui, qui pensent qu'ils ont la meilleure façon, leur façon de voir les choses, c'est la meilleure, c'est la bonne, on, on doit se rencontrer en, en personne, c'est la meilleure façon de voir les choses. Il y a d'autres personnes qui pensent que non, il faut tout faire en ligne, on reste à la maison, on fait tout en ligne, c'est la meilleure façon de voir les choses. Et, et on, on se fait tous un peu des experts et on pense tous savoir, avoir compris euh, ou avoir reçu, si on veut, un peu la vision divine, la, la, la pensée de Dieu par rapport à comment les choses doivent fonctionner. Et la question que je vous pose est la suivante. Alors que Dieu nous regarde, qu'est-ce qu'il pense? Alors qu'il alors qu regarde le monde, et puis il voit des gens qui se pensent, qui pensent savoir, tout connaître. Qu'est-ce qu'il doit penser de ce phénomène-là? J'aimerais vous lire une écriture, une écriture pardon, qui se trouve en Ésaïe 66, verset 2. Ésaïe 66, verset 2, il s'agit de la chose suivante. Ainsi a dit l'Éternel. Le ciel est mon trône et la terre mon marche-pied. Quelle maison me bâtirez-vous? Quel lieu sera celui de mon repos? Car toutes ces choses, ma main les a faites et toutes ces choses existent par elle, par elle, dit l'Éternel. Et voici à qui je regarde, à celui qui est humble, qui a l'esprit abattu et qui tremble à ma parole. Dieu porte son regard non sur la personne qui pense l'avoir compris, mais sur la personne qui est humble, au fait, la personne qui sait qu'elle ne comprend pas et qui tremble à la parole de Dieu. Est-ce que c'est toi ce matin? Je connais beaucoup de gens, en fait, qui tremblent lorsqu'ils entendent la parole de quelqu'un sur YouTube, ou ils tremblent lorsqu'ils entendent la parole de leurs politiciens favoris ou leurs idéologies politiques favoris. Il y a beaucoup de personnes qui tremblent lorsqu'ils entendent la voix de leur docteur ou leur psychologue, mais étrangement, lorsqu'il s'agit de la voix et de la parole de Dieu, on se dit non, mais bon, ça va, c'est juste la parole de Dieu. Et, et il y a un moment de ma vie, au fait, où euh, je pensais un peu avoir compris 
à l'algorithme euh, de Dieu. Euh, étant quelqu'un qui a grandi dans une culture euh, euh, principalement chrétienne, je viens d'Afrique de l'Ouest, en Côte d'Ivoire, euh, je ressentais pas nécessairement un besoin d'approfondir ma relation avec Dieu. En fait, lorsque euh, j'ai été réinvité à l'église, mon attente était que ça ne change rien. Euh, je pensais que j'allais bien, ma vie allait bien, et donc je n'avais pas vraiment besoin de, de, de connaître Dieu plus. Mais évidemment, j'avais profondément tort. Et tout a changé pour moi lorsque j'ai décidé la chose suivante. J'ai décidé de prendre mes préjugés, ce que je pensais que je savais, de les mettre de côté et de m'asseoir et d'écouter ce que Dieu a à me dire, d'accepter d'être enseigné et de chercher Dieu de tout mon cœur et de toute ma force. Et j'ai réalisé que les voix de Dieu sont au-dessus de mes voix et ses pensées sont au-dessus de mes pensées. Et c'était la première fois de ma vie où j'ai réellement connu Jésus. Et je, je, je suis devenu fou amoureux de cette personne-là qui est Jésus. Et lors, dans ce moment-là, dans cette étape-là de ma vie, mais tout a changé pour moi. Euh, mes priorités, euh, ma vision du monde, euh, tout a été réorienté par rapport à la personne de Jésus. Et j'ai pu faire connaissance de l'amour de Dieu parce que j'avais décidé de m'humilier et d'accepter d'apprendre et d'être ouvert par rapport à ce qu'il me dit. Et pour être honnête avec vous, je pense au fur et à mesure que les années avancent et que le temps passe, il y a une tentation un peu qu'on qu fait tous face en tant que chrétien, euh, qui est la tentation de vivre notre foi en se basant sur notre propre expérience euh, en tant que chrétien au lieu de faire confiance à l'Esprit de Dieu. Je m'explique. Euh, on a tous un peu au fait ce que j'appelle... Euh, euh, des années d'expérience en tant que chrétien, euh, tu sais, certains, certains 8 ans, certains 10 ans, certains 15 ans, euh, ça fait 15 ans qu'ils sont là, ils savent un peu comment ça marche. Et, euh, et la tentation, en fait, c'est de vivre notre foi chrétienne en se reposant plus sur l'expérience ou la connaissance qu'on a accumulée pendant ces années-là qu'en faisant confiance présentement dans notre vie à l'Esprit de Dieu. Et la question que je vais te poser en ce moment, c'est que est-ce que tu vis ta voix, ta foi chrétienne en t'abandonnant à l'Esprit de Dieu ou en te basant sur tes connaissances du passé? Et un bon indicateur qui, qui peut, peut être révélateur en ce qui concerne l'état de notre cœur par rapport à cette question-là, euh, c'est une autre question qu'on peut se poser, qui est la suivante. Euh, et c'est une question que je me suis posée plusieurs fois. Euh, c'est est-ce que je suis en train de chercher Dieu présentement de tout mon cœur? Est-ce que présentement, je suis en train de chercher Dieu de tout mon cœur, de toutes mes forces et de toutes mes pensées? Parce que la personne qui cherche Dieu de tout son cœur, de toutes ses forces et de toutes ses pensées, c'est qu'elle a besoin de se reposer sur lui et qu'elle ne peut pas se reposer sur sa propre connaissance. Et puis en ce moment, c'est un peu où je suis dans ma vie, je suis dans l'état de ma vie où euh, j'ai travaillé pour le ministère un petit peu. Euh, là, euh, je termine mon bac, je commence à chercher un emploi en ingénierie. Et euh, en fait, j'ai aucune idée. <rire> Ma vie va ressembler à quoi dans 3-4 mois? Euh, de quoi va... Euh, de Comment vivre spécifiquement, en fait, ma, ma foi dans ce contexte-là? Euh, j'ai jamais vécu ça. Mais c'est tellement une opportunité extraordinaire de chercher Dieu, de me reposer sur lui, d'avoir la foi et d'être excité par rapport à ce qui s'en vient. Euh, et et, et c'est un peu là-dessus que je vais adopter, que j'essaie d'adopter. Et Dieu est fidèle. Alors que je le cherche, alors que je prends des conseils euh, et, et je me rapproche de lui, il me dirige et me montre un peu quoi faire et je suis vraiment reconnaissant par rapport à ça. Et donc, je vais laisser Jenaya qui va continuer un peu à partager sur ce thème-là. Merci, Nate. So, yeah, I will not be sharing in French, but <laughs> as, <laughs> as I listen to Nate um, and as I think about this theme, God is not an algorithm, I find it really interesting because at any point in my Christian life, If I thought about that, I would say, of course, I believe that like God doesn't work that way. Um, but as I think about it more, I wanted to share just a couple examples of why I actually do tend to think of God as an algorithm. Um, so when I joined the church six years ago, um, it was in Chicago and I joined an amazing church family. Uh, there were so many people my age who were like faithful in the same season of life. They were starting work, paying off debt. Um, singles, dating, young marrieds, like it was an amazing church with a lot of structure, a lot of activities, multiple regions, cool events. Um, it was so nice. And I thought like, wow, this is what God's kingdom looks like. 
Like it was awesome. <laughs> um, no, it goes without saying, obviously, that there were problems. There were still tensions and things happening. But if you fast forward three years later, I moved from Chicago to Montreal for school mm. and I joined another family in our kingdom. Uh, but this church didn't look the same. In Montreal yeah. at that time, uh, there wasn't a single couple in leadership. Uh, so I got to see a different way of a body working together. There were several couples who I know were working full-time jobs and rotating to preach, to serve, to shepherd, to take care of the of the body. And I was really, really impressed, honestly. Um, I love the strength of the church that I saw here. People were present <laughs> and they seemed happy to be there. And of course, just as in Chicago, there were problems, right? There were tensions. But mm -hmm. what I felt like I was seeing was such a great example of, of perseverance. Yeah. And I, I felt like if I think about it, it really broke down the first algorithm that I had developed in my mind, like the set of rules or conditions that make room for, for God's kingdom, that make God's kingdom. Interesting. And that is because God is not an algorithm. And I think it's a very human thing to try to identify like rules to live by, just as Nate was saying, like what needs to be in place for God to work in my life. <laughs> One thing that I think we all are tempted to think is that if we add, if I add fasting and prayer Guilty. to anything happening in my life already, does that guarantee that yeah. I'll get the results that I want to see from God? Um, Mm -hmm. Interesting, right? So I just want to pause here for a moment and share three Proverbs. Proverbs 19, 21 says, Many are the plans in a person's heart, but it is the Lord's purpose that prevails. Proverbs 16, 9 says, In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. And Proverbs 16, 2 says, All a person's ways seem pure to them, but motives are weighed by the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, I would argue that, I would argue, honestly, that we are all working with some kind of algorithm in our mind. And most likely, in the last 10 months with COVID, that algorithm has been severely disrupted. Right? For me, if I'm thinking back, I felt like perhaps God's work in my life depended on regular fellowship time, being able to hug people, having time with friends over dinner or whatever, whenever I want it. Um, even singing songs in person at church rather than like alone or with my husband in the living room. <laughs> I didn't realize how much I depended on certain conditions uh, until I didn't have them anymore. How much I depended on them to, to continue believing that God was at work in my life until I didn't have them. I had developed a new algorithm, essentially. Uh, God will work when X, Y, and Z at minimum are in place. And that is, that's crazy, honestly, because if I look over my life, like I've seen God work in crazy ways. Like he has turned bad situations into beautiful ones. He said no to what I thought were good ideas, only to provide in a different way. There is not a case in my life where God's work <laughs> depends on my circumstances or the conditions that I have in place. But I think the tendency to define what is good for myself is a normal one. And then I take that and I try to stick to it the best I can. And I would bet that that's the case for you too. Um, all a person's ways seem pure to them. That's what Proverbs 16.2 says. And I think it's kind of what it's getting at. Last year in January, where we were made sense more or less, right? You had plans personally. We had plans personally. We had plans in our ministry. And all of my plans and the way of doing things seemed pure to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then a few months into the pandemic, I started to doubt quite a bit. Like, was God using me at all? <laughs> uh, was he working in other people's lives? Uh, I struggled so much because I felt limited by the ways of restrictions that we had. And I felt just bad, I guess, because I couldn't be with people to support them mm -hmm. or to check in on them, to hug them. Um, and I know we've been under these waves of restrictions for the last 10 months. And so many of us are likely still in that place of doubt and confusion. Mm. But the word says clearly that God weighs our motives. He is not limited by less than ideal situations. And right. he's not judging us by our outcomes. Okay. But he does look at our heart and he looks at the reasons why we do what we do. I think... Yeah. Like Josh was getting at, like we could all benefit from looking more deeply, mm -hmm. identifying our motives, our reasons why, 
and choosing again to glorify God, Amen. choosing again to trust him to establish our steps, choosing again to trust that his purpose is good and that it will prevail. Mm -hmm. God is not an algorithm. As Josh and his wife are doing, they I would like to do too, right? They've stripped away their dependence on their circumstances and they're continuing to connect with God personally, continuing to try to honor him in the seasons and the circumstances that God has given them. And God is establishing their steps. And I know he wants to establish yours too. Yeah. I, I just want to share one last thing and say that I'm so, so grateful that God is not an algorithm because when I was a sinner, he did not look at me and say, Oof, man, you're complicated. <laughs> I can't work much in you. Or he didn't look at me and say like, oh, we got to work on your character before I can pull you out of this. Like, no, he chose to love me. He chose to save me. He chose to give me an amazing future with a purpose that has so far prevailed and will in the future. Mm -hmm. And I am so grateful for that. And I know that you are too. So I would just urge you to think back to your motives, to be compelled by love, by God's love, as it says in 2 Corinthians. Be compelled to go out, to serve, to ask your neighbor what they need and to try to help them with it, to yeah. call somebody you haven't spoke to in a while, uh, to take extra time with God after 8 p.m. if you can't go out because of curfew. Like it's, there's so many things that we could can do and we should remember that God is looking at our motives. So let his love be your motive. Amen. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that. And I guess I want to conclude with one last thought. God is not limited by our circumstances. And so let's not limit the Holy Spirit of God. And thinking about the way that things are right now, uh, I just want to encourage you, and especially those that are our age, uh, more of the younger generation, let's own the kingdom of God, guys. Right now, is our time to think through things, to go to the Lord and figure out how we can be disciples that glorify Him wherever we are. And a conviction of mine is that the church is the answer to the world, just like Jesus is the answer to the world. And we have the Holy Spirit of the living God dwelling in us. And how powerful is that? I just want to encourage you guys, let's, let's come together and really seek to be the kingdom of God together. And for the more mature disciples, God is not done with you yet. He has a lot more to do with you. And I would dare you to allow him. Just like he's used you in the past, he wants to use you right now for even bigger things. And I would dare you to go to him and allow him to do that. And thank you so much guys for listening to us and looking forward to connect more and uh, to the future services. And I hope you were encouraged, inspired, and call higher through your service. Take care, guys. Thank you so much for joining today. Merci d'être parmi nous ce matin. Un gros, gros uh, merci à Nate et Jenea pour un travail formidable uh, une fois de plus ce matin. Uh, nous avons beaucoup apprécié ce que vous avez uh, partagé, mais uh, nous apprécions par-dessus tout ce que vous êtes, ce que vous faites, ce que vous faites, pardon, 
et à euh, continuer votre merveilleux travail à, à Montréal et euh, partout au Canada, vraiment. Uh, thank you so much, Josh Udall, for good sharing. Thank you for being so raw, mm -hmm. vulnerable this morning. I'm sure many of us were moved and uh, inspired by your uh, sharing as well. Uh, well, congratulations, Khadija. What an inspiring sharing. Uh, Jillian and I, we are remembering uh, mm -hmm. When uh, your mom, uh, Aniera, got baptized in the fall of 2001, and it's amazing to see 20 years later, uh, mm -hmm. see how God worked uh, in your family. Congratulations once again, Khadija. We're very proud of you. Yes, we are. And uh, also just wanted to say, most of you probably know the uh, International Women's Day that will be celebrated all over the world at the beginning of March. And uh, we have the pleasure as the Eastern Canadian churches to be able to celebrate together. So we're going to have a special service on uh, Sunday, March the 7th. So please save the date, share the date with your friends and family. And uh, we are so looking forward to being, being able to celebrate together women and just all that they've accomplished and all that God will continue to do mm -hmm. through us as well. So thanks. Amen. Merci. Uh, on vous souhaite de passer une très bonne journée, bonne semaine. Thank you for joining once again. Have a beautiful day, beautiful week. We love you. See you next time.